Blog Talk Radio. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen, across this great country. It's Tuesday. We find ourselves next to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Jacob Steele, the Q. Who knows what else is around here? The Browns are not getting ready to play football quite yet. Training camp hasn't opened, but I will tell you what is definitely open, and it's open 365 days a year, 24-7, if you want to catch their show. Peter Ray, American Sports History Podcast, blogtalkradio.com forward slash Mancini Sports. Podcast platforms powered now by Mancini Media. Call in number 347-205-9631. Goes by quick, so make sure you catch that archive version. So without further ado, more of him, less of me. Let me lay the red carpet down, put the podium in its place, hand off the mic. First of all, Peter, how are you? Second of all, how can you be reached? Third of all, another legend steps into the lounge in Cleveland, Ohio tonight. Hi, Mark. I'm doing very well. I have a YouTube channel. It's my name, Peter J. Ray, history videos, a lot of Cleveland baseball videos. Uh, you're absolutely right about tonight's guest. He's from uh, Santa Rosa, California, st- lives there today. Former producer and play-by-play, play-by-play announcer at NBC Sports C- California, Head baseball coach at one time at Sonoma Academy. Former athletics communication and marketing specialist at Sonoma State University, and he's the owner of YSN365.com, the youth sports network. 30 years in sports broadcasting, 30 years coaching high school baseball. What an incredible resume. Welcome to the show, Mr. Dave Cox. Well, thank you, guys. Great to be here. I got a question, though. What kind of food is Cleveland famous for? I mean, Chicago's got the pizza. and Does Cleveland have any kind of food that they're famous for? I don't know, man. I, I've never been there. Uh, well, yeah, you'd think I, would, I could answer that quickly. They, they have this – well, they're known for this stadium mustard at the old Cleveland Municipal Stadium, sort of a brown mustard. And Well, it's an okay, ethnic all right. It's an ethnic all town, right. a lot of uh, – you know, there's, I think, a ta- little Italy on the east side, so a lot of folks are going over there for uh, Italian so food. So nothing, and basically. That. Nothing is what you're saying. No, nothing. Not, really. the, not, the, not the thing that jumps out at me, no. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Maybe okay. there is, Sorry. and I'm ignorant. But uh, So, uh, Dave, can you, can you give us an overview of your career in sports? Well, gosh, you know, I kind of stumbled into uh, doing the sports broadcasting thing. A really good friend of mine from college was doing some local sports broadcast down in the Santa Cruz area, a gentleman by the name of Rusty Reed. He's got his own fan page on Facebook now. Um, and I thought it was such a great idea that I came back up to the Santa Rosa area and talked the cable company into doing uh, the same thing, local sports broadcasting. And uh, they had their own TV channel, the cable company, and I somehow talked them into it. I'd never really done play-by-play before other than as a kid in my driveway and backyard pretending. And they said, you want to do the play-by-play? And I said, sure, I can do that. And then uh, I did that for 17 and a half years after that. I was coaching baseball kind of all along, started off coaching uh, kind of senior little league level and a little bit of high school JV level. And I've coached every level imaginable from there, but um, that's why I kind of started the sports broadcasting thing. And from there uh, learned how to produce, started really focusing more on the graphics and where we're putting the cameras and the replays and got more and more involved on the producing end of it. By 1997, won a local cable ace award for the best local sports broadcast in the country, which was really cool. And went on to do college and professional stuff from there. And today I, I still do some play by play on my, with my website live streaming. Uh, but I also produce uh, more for television, Sac state football, a little bit of Cal Poly, a little bit of UC Davis football, a lot of big sky stuff, which is kind of cool. We did the road to Reno tournament for basketball a few years ago. So I enjoy that. That's a lot of fun. And, I don't have to bring my own equipment when I do that, so it's kind of cool. But that's that's the basic overview. I've been doing it a long time, and uh, my brain kind of functions really well in that live sports broadcasting environment where I'm literally at times doing three or four things at once. So um, I'm kind of weird, but that's the way it works for me. Of the uh, you've, of baseball, football, and basketball, which have you done more the most? That's a tough question. Probably baseball because of the length of the season it's not only spring but it bleeds into summer 
Uh, we used to have a professional independent team here in the area called the Sonoma County Crushers, the Western Baseball League. That was a lot of fun. We used to broadcast all their Saturday afternoon games, and they used to draw a really good crowd before the league kind of folded up. But I've done a lot of baseball. I've done a lot of basketball, too. You know, football's one game a week, sometimes two games a week if you do a Friday-Saturday turnaround. Um, and I really like football. Football is kind of a made-for-television, made-for-broadcasting sport. And I'm probably most knowledgeable about baseball because of my coaching background, and I've probably done baseball more than anything. Uh, can you? T- would you like to talk about your uh, career as a baseball coach? Sure, yeah. I've, I've coached, like I said, just about every level possible from t-ball up through college. And um, my most recent venture, uh, they started a college wood bat team here, kind of like the Cape Cod League. Uh, there's the CCL team called the Hillsburg Prune Packers and the team that I got involved with called the Santa Rosa Athletics. My son was playing and I was going to supposedly just do the PA system, but then both of the coaches had personal issues and couldn't uh, manage the team. And since I have a lot of coaching and managing experience, they kind of said, Dave, can you do it? And I did it. And we had a blast. Started off kind of rough because it was a brand new team, but by the end of the season, we were very competitive and uh, we were we were winning, and, and uh, I think we, you know, just missed the playoffs that first year. The team is back this year after last year's COVID hiatus, and so I'm going to hopefully stream some of their games. Starting this week, we're going to try to do some games. Before that, I did a five-year stint at a little private school here called Sonoma Academy, and that was a lot of fun, small school, um, in a small school league. We had a, a one team in particular that was uh, a private school, St. Vincent, that was our big competition. We managed to beat them for the first time my first year. And in my second year, we went on a bizarre run of no hitters. I had some great, I had three really good arms and some other guys that could throw the ball over the plate too pretty well. And we went on a bizarre streak of six consecutive no hitters, which by all accounts is a national record. I called, uh, Mark Tennis at Cal High Sports after I think our third or fourth and said, do you have any idea what the record is? We just got like three no hitters in a row. And he's like, I don't have any record of anybody having more than that. So as far as I know, that's the record. And then it got picked up by USA Today and, uh, you know, just kind of took on a life of its own. We had all this media attention at our games, which the kids got a big kick out of. And uh, that was fun. That was one of the one of the funnest things I've experienced in my coaching career. It was It was bizarre, but it was fun. And how about your own playing, uh, baseball playing career? Well, I played at uh, Cardinal Newman High School. I played a little bit of semi-pro after that. Um, I went to Pepperdine University. I actually tried out for the team there, but I had no clue back in the late 70s how good uh, Pepperdine University was. I thought I was going to be able to walk on, no problem, kind of a small school, 2,200 undergrads my freshman year. They went to the College World Series, so I was in a little bit over my head for my skill level, but I tried out, you know, and I think I was probably pretty close. I was very good defensively. I was very fast. I could run a four flat home to first base. I was a switch hitter, um, but lacked a little bit of power in the bat. You know, I was more of a singles kind of guy, get on base, but I was very good defensively, and I knew the game really well, um, which suited me really well as a coach. I, I kind of look back on uh, how I – how I interacted with my coaches and kind of realized that I was kind of always thinking about the deeper parts of the game. And I love baseball because of that. There's just so many, when you're managing and coaching a baseball game, there's a million decisions to make. Every pitch changes the situation slightly and where you're going to position the fielders and what pitch you're going to call. And just every, and I just love that. Again, my brain gets, is very good at wrapping around multiple decisions all at once and, so I kind of need that stimulation. So anyways, that's that's the short end of it right there. And uh, have you changed over the years as a baseball coach? Yeah, I would say definitely. You know, I, I really started off. I was I was a young man when I started coaching. I was like 29 years old, and I was, I guess, what you would call kind of a player's coach. I was still young enough that the players kind of uh, – looked at me as a big brother kind of, and I was pretty loosey goosey with the way I ran the team. And, um, I was always really, I was always very competitive. I hate losing. I I like to win, but I hate to lose. So I developed a knack for, uh, getting the team ready in terms of all the different situations that are possible and having them ready to conquer those situations and, and come out on top. And so I was always successful. We always won right off the bat. Um, and coaching some senior little league teams, the all-star teams I really liked because we had a really good all-star group. 
um, in the area that I coached in Rankin Valley. We went deep. We made it all the way to the divisional uh, tournament a few times, which is basically like the state championship, which is one step away from Western regionals. And we got that deep into it several times. And um, so I always enjoyed that, you know, but later in my career, I would say as I got older, I became uh, a little bit different. I always still try to make it fun and relate to the kids as best as possible. But um, the, the further you get into it, the more you know about the game and the more action you need to take in terms of how you run your practices and getting the team ready. And there's a lot less goofing around and having, you know, downtime. It's just all business for me. And I like to, you know, and I always tell the kids, you know, this is the the work that's going to pay off because you're going to be ready for every possible situation when we have our first game. And that's always the challenge. You have X amount of practices before your first game and you've got to get them ready for all the different situations. And, and there's really almost an infinite number of different situations that arise in the course of a baseball game, but you do your best to get them ready for every situation so that they feel confident in those situations. And that's always been kind of my approach. Uh, how about the, uh, the different types of pitches? Did you know how to throw them and help the pitchers with curve balls? Yeah. And- you know, I really did. I, 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 I taught myself how to pitch a little bit. My grandfather, who played back in the early 1900s, used to play catch with me in the front yard, and he taught me how to throw a curveball. And um, he talked a little bit about he played at Odd Fellows Park in San Francisco, and he was a pitcher. And um, I never had a super strong arm, so I had to learn. I started throwing curves and junk when I was like 10, 11 years old. And I always was very good at determining what pitch – to throw to the hitter by the way he stood, by what I'd thrown next. And so my poor catchers, I would, I literally had like seven pitches. And, and so I remember this one uh, guy that caught me a lot in, in, in little league and in senior little league, Paul Bartholo, man, he, I had all these pitches and, and I don't know if he knew what was going on. Cause I would shake them off. I called my own pitches, you know, I was shaking them off, shaking them off, shaking them off, you know, five. Yeah, let's go with five. And um, so I had, a, you know, I was pretty good at it, you know? And so, I learned a lot more. There's a baseball coaching book uh, by the by the great Ron Polk, who was at Mississippi State, and it's like the Bible of coaching as far as I'm concerned. I love that book, and I and I read that thing cover to cover. And I when I got into more competitive, higher level coaching, and there was, you know, particularly the slider, which is kind of the bread and butter pitch that I taught all my pitchers, and I kind of teach a hybrid of that, which is more of a cutter, which is what I taught my son to throw. And he, you know, played all the way up uh, a little bit of college baseball through high school and uh, college wood bat and had great success with. He mastered that pitch probably better than any kid I've ever coached, which was great because I sat on the bucket in the front yard with him a lot, you know, teaching him how to throw that little cutter because it's easy on the arm. It's, it's, it's very deceptive to the batter, but um, that's kind of how it, how it grew and transformed. And I love calling pitches that whole aspect of the game is really, you know, what I think is the most fun, that pitcher-catcher um, uh, relationship that I have and knowing when to waste a pitch and how to set a batter up for the next pitch. And and I like to call the pitches because if there's a mistake and the kid hits a double off the fence, it's on me because I called the pitch. And my catchers, if they get developed to the point where they can call their own, I let them call their own. But I always ask, you know, do you want me to call them or do you want to call them yourself? And they always – most of the time we'll say, well, you call them, coach. You're really good at you call them, you know. So um, I know there's different philosophies on that. But, you know, I think it's uh, it's one aspect of the game where I can help the team win. And so, you know, I'll do it if, if the kids want me to, and, and they usually do. On your teams, if you had a, your players steal home very often? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I have had that happen uh, occasionally. Uh, in, in Little League, I had a kid that was – like bigger and faster than everybody else and he used to steal home he kind of had the green light when the it was it was kind of dirty pool I, I you know when I look back on it I'm, I'm you know but again I'm really competitive and he used to take off when the catcher would throw the ball back to the pitcher he would take off her home plate and he would make it about 85 percent of the time because he was just bigger and faster than the rest of the kids and he used to drive the other teams crazy but um you know that was you know, but I, you know, I love that. If a, if a kid's going out of the windup and he's not paying attention, I will try to take advantage of that. I, I always, you know, running the bases, that aspect of the game, um, to me, is another area where I really focus a lot of attention on. I like to, to steal bases. I like to teach my teams how to get a jump against the lefty, against the righty. Is he giving you one look? Is he going out of the windup and not paying attention to you? Um, on, in contrast, on defense, I work a lot on holding. Um, holding runners on, 
on throwing runners out. We, we spend a ton of time on what I call steel defense, defending the steel. And I make sure my, my pitchers give my, my catcher a chance. I pitch out a lot. You know, most in high school, I don't see a lot of teams pitching out, but I will use the pitch out on a regular basis, if nothing else, to let the other coach know that I'm, we're, I'm not going to let you just steal on me. We're going to pitch out, even if they're not going, and that puts that in his mind. But it also gives my catcher a really good chance if I do get it right and they are stealing. And I put pressure on my catcher. If, if I call the pitch out and the guy's going, I expect you to throw him out. You know, that's, you know, I got it right, and I'm giving you every opportunity. So you need to throw that guy out, you know. And um, I had one catcher, a young man by the name of Oscar McCauley, who you know became like a son to me because he caught for me for four years, freshman all the way through senior year, and he got to the point by his senior year where he was throwing out about 40% of would-be base stealers. So that was good stuff. So if we can win that battle and we can steal way more bases than our opponent, we got a pretty good chance of winning most games. You know, you hear people complain about uh, baseball announcers who start talking about all kinds of different things, sort of extraneous to the show. And of course, there is a lot of time in baseball. What are your thoughts about about that, about just sort of talking about different things that are not related to the, the, the game right at hand? Well, there's a time and a place for that. You know, there is. And, and you can work in stuff with baseball. But my focus has always been on the game itself. And I, I do kind of have a pet peeve with certain announcers. I won't mention any names, but some announcers come into it with the approach, and I don't know if they do it consciously or subconsciously, of trying to show how much they know. And, you know, the game is not about me when I'm doing play-by-play. My job is to make, to draw you into the game and make you understand why this is a big game. Because every game, I don't care if it's a Little League game or the World Series of MLB, that game means something to the players and the coaches that are involved. And my job is to figure out how to get you to buy into that and, and make you want to watch the game because you care about the outcome of the game. So I, my philosophy on play-by-play has always been to focus on the game and try to enhance the moment and the situation and, 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 and point that out to the viewer. Why is this a big pitch? It's three and two with the bases loaded with two outs and the runners are going to be moving. And it's a, you know, you know, why, why is this a big deal right now? And I, you know, this team is down by two runs. And so, you know, that's, that's my thought on it. Um, I'm not there to tell a bunch of stories, although I will work stories in and depending on my color commentator and my relationship with him, it's appropriate or not appropriate, but I don't like to get too distracted from the game in front of me. Now, Dave, you're, you are a San Francisco Bay, uh, sports fan. What are your thoughts on the 1972, 73, 1974 Oakland A's? Wow. That was a, that was a pretty amazing run. There was a, there was a lot of controversy around that team, you know, uh, they there were fights in the dugout and they you know they were kind of a crazy bunch you know but that era was very unique um it, you look back on the talent that they had now and you see why they were so successful especially with the pitching staff that they had but i remember at the time thinking that they shouldn't really be winning all these games and i was more of a giants fan i did follow the a's very strongly in 71 because I liked Vita Blue, his rookie season, and I was I went to some of the games, but I was more of a Giants fan, and 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 I kind of kind of got sick of all the publicity that the A's were getting in the Bay Area at the time, and some of my friends were A's fans, and they were just you know so into it. So I don't know if I, I was rooting against them, but uh, maybe a little bit at the time, you know, kind of wanting that bubble to burst. But um, that was a pretty amazing run, and when you look back on the talent that they had, and especially in the pitching staff, you can kind of see why they were as successful. But at the time, I didn't, I didn't get it. You know, I didn't really get it. I thought Cincinnati Reds were better than them. I thought there was there was a few teams in baseball that were better than them at the time. What are your thoughts on the San Francisco 49ers of the Joe Montana era? Well, that was amazing because I had. I'd grown up a 40. I always kind of root for the underdog. That's kind of the thing, and that's why I, I kind of started rooting for the 49ers in the late 60s because they they weren't very good, and and uh, and even the Warriors and the Giants to a certain extent. Although the Giants had some pretty good talent in the early 70s, but that season kind of came out of nowhere. And a good friend of mine from high school had see his family had season tickets, and we used to go to the games 76, 77, 78, and the 49ers weren't very good, you know, and. Uh, and so I was in college at the time, and we did not have a TV. Me and my buddies did not have a television set. 
um, at the start of that 1980-81 season. And so we used to go over to some girlfriends of ours that lived in some condominiums down the street and knock on their door every Sunday morning. And they would be like, what are you guys doing here? You know, they'd be, they'd have been out partying the night before. And we were like, we're watching football. Let's go. We'd bring food and everything else. And they, by the end of that season, they were football fans. It was hilarious. And the, and of course the 49ers run was incredible. And they made it, it was just unbelievable that they won the Super Bowl that year. And a lot of people thought it was a fluke, you know, that it wasn't going to happen again. And I, I think the, the next season there was the strike shortened season. They didn't make the playoffs and, you know, they kind of stumbled, but then they kind of redeemed and they proved that it wasn't a fluke, that Bill Walsh was a great coach and Joe Montana was a great uh, quarterback and that they had a ton of talent. But, um, you know, the the thing that I really – my favorite player was Ronnie Lott, and I think Ronnie Lott to this day is the best defensive football player I've ever seen because he saved so many touchdowns that season. And, you know, there'd be a breakaway run and somebody would bring the guy down from behind at the five yard line. And it was Ronnie lot, you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, that their defense was really, really good that year. And that kind of held the ship together. And the golden state warriors in recent years, three titles in four, was it three titles in four years or. Yeah. The the warriors had, yeah. They've had a really good run. And, um, that was that's been a lot of fun to watch. The Bay Area really got going on that, and I've been to a few games, and I follow the Warriors a little bit, um, not so much this year, but uh, during those playoff runs, you know, just kind of an incredible run, you know. And I think that again, they were kind of an underdog team. Obviously, Steph Curry um, is a great player and a great scorer, but they also had the other pieces of the puzzle that that made it all work, you know. And that's kind of the unique thing with basketball. You can go on those kind of runs because it's you know five guys on the court at once you know football you know you got to have you know 22 guys you know that that are good players it's it's a lot harder to, to to maintain that over the course of time but in basketball it's truly possible if you have three or four really star players and they can stick together for a five-year run you can win two or three championships in a row and i think that's kind of what's happened with the warriors now backing up a little bit i'll give you some names here any thoughts might come that you might have Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, Bobby Bonds, Chris Spire, Juan Marichal, Gaylord Perry, and Bobby Mercer. Well, I loved all those guys. Um, my favorite player was no doubt was Bobby Bonds. You know, Willie Mays was a great player, but by the time I really started catching on, he was a little bit past his prime. And I, I of course heard all the stories and, and loved the man. And, um, when he went to the Mets, that was kind of heartbreaking. But I did go to a game. I had my parents buy tickets to the Mets-Giants game when he came back to Candlestick as a Met, and I think he hit a home run that day. So that was pretty cool. But Bobby Bonds was my favorite. I love Bobby Bonds. I was super sad when he got traded to the Yankees for Bobby Mercer. Bobby Mercer was a great player also, but he wasn't my guy. You know, Bobby Bonds was my guy. And I always felt sorry for Bobby because he kind of got kicked around after that. Once he left the Giants, man, he got traded to a bunch of different teams. And I don't think he ever really uh, got the credit, you know, after the year he won the all-star MVP, you know, I don't really think he got the credit he deserved. Now, Juan Marichal was, you know, just an unbelievable pitcher. I don't think he gets uh, as much national recognition as some of the great pitchers from of that era, like Sandy Koufax and Bob Gibson, but he was certainly as good as any of them. He had a couple of years where you look at his ERA and his win total and it was phenomenal, you know, and, and, uh, Gaylord Perry, of course, is more famous for the spitball than anything else, but he was a great pitcher, too, and he maintained a very, very long career. Um, Chris Spire was a great shortstop. I remember his rookie season, you know, and how, how well he did that year, and um, I'm really good friends with his brother, Bill Spire, who lives here in Sonoma County, so I uh, have that little family connection there, which is kind of cool, but I loved all those guys, you know, you, you know, and, and they were the, the heroes of my childhood, for sure. Uh, you, you've do you have any stories that you'd like to re- recount from your many years as a broadcaster? Well, you know, I've, I've done a lot of games. I have a catalog of over a thousand games. I don't I lost track, you know, I've probably done closer to 1500 now uh, that I've been doing my website, but um, you know, I've done, like I said, a lot of different levels of play, you know, college, high school, whatever. But uh, some of the stuff that really stands out, I did, uh, 
Tom Brady when he was in high school at Sarah High School. They played Cardinal Newman up here in Santa Rosa. I believe it was 94, maybe 95. And that was, you know, one of those games you don't really think much about. You, you know, and I go back and I've listened to some of the play-by-play. And we were talking about him. Yeah, he's being recruited by Michigan. He's pretty good. He, he had the size and he had a good season that year. But, you know, that was all we knew at the time. Who knew he was going to go on to be, you know, the greatest of all time or whatever. But, you know. Uh, so that's probably one of the most famous games, and that that highlights of that game have been uh, seen on YouTube. It's had millions of hits. That they've been used on the Super Bowl. It gets recycled. And I've got the entire game in my garage, but I need to digitize it. If anybody has a three quarter inch deck that still works, I really need it bad because it's on three quarter inch tape, and it's got to be digitized and then uploaded. So uh, that's the challenge there. And I'm I'm working on it. Okay, I just recently got a Roku channel, YSN 365. We have our own. Roku channel. So a lot of the live games that I've done recently are on there. But my goal is to get some of those older games, those archive games. I've got CC Sabathia playing basketball in high school in a NorCal championship game when he was at Vallejo High School. And he was a great basketball player. He easily could have played college basketball. But of course, he got drafted and went on to a great baseball career. But man, he was big and fast. He could get up and down the court. And they had a great team. That Vallejo team was incredible. Um, So anyway, there's a couple highlights there. fun you know uh, i love doing play by play and and i always seem to uh, as much college sports as i've done i always seem to gravitate back to the high school level because I, I really love it i think it's uh still the purest form of sports and uh, there's something about a friday night football game that i just really get excited about you know i i think uh the fans appreciate it more than anything and i just really enjoy it uh, now, you mentioned Bobby Bonds. He played for Cleveland. I was also really excited that, that, that he was here. And uh, and then, of course, Dwayne Kuyper, who was started as was a tremendous second baseman for Cleveland. And long Have you, have you met Dwayne Kuyper? He's been forever in uh, doing Giants games on the radio. You know, I don't think I've ever met Dwayne. I've met uh, Kruko a couple times. I was doing a podcast a few years ago called Major League Clubhouse, and we would go down to the Wednesday afternoon games. And um, you know, I don't think I've ever met Dwayne in person. I'm trying to remember, maybe somewhere along the line, but definitely met Kruko. He's a great guy. I love his style. And um, there's been some great – we've been very blessed in the Bay Area with great broadcasters, you know. Uh, John Miller's really good. I grew up listening to Bill King and Lon Simmons, and uh, and and those guys were just incredible. But, um, it, it, you know, it makes a big difference. You know, it, it goes together, certainly, the, the broadcaster and the team and the success of the team. And uh, like I said, I think that's um, I think that's what makes you know local sports uh, the best, in my opinion. The San Francisco Giants in 2010, 2012, and 2014. Yeah, the even year run that was pretty amazing. You know, uh, some great stuff. There's still a few guys around from that from those teams. You know, Buster Posey's still there, and and Brandon Belt. And, um, I can't remember when Crawford came aboard, Brandon Crawford, but those are kind of the last three guys from that era. The pitching staff's all different now. Um, but they had, you know, they had some great pitching. And uh, really, like, Tim Lincecum was amazing. You know, I was there the day he threw his na- last no-hitter. Uh, we were doing the, the podcast that day, and that was an incredible day. You know, one of, uh, just, you know, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen, right, when you go to a baseball game and when you when you see a, a major league no hitter it's kind of it's kind of surreal when it unfolds like that um but those those three seasons were pretty incredible pretty unbelievable you know as long as i had been alive um the giants had never won the world series you know and my uh, good friend of mine uh who's no longer with us was a yankees fan and so you know he kind of sensed when when we had it in the bag and called me and congratulated me because he'd experienced several of those and so that was very special for me yeah it's uh it's funny because they you have these teams they 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 don't want, they've never won a World Series and the years pass and years pass and I remember I used to enjoy the uh, Charlie Brown comic where about the '62 World Series where they were so close where he's complaining about how why couldn't Willie McCovey have hit the ball you know a few feet either way <laughs> but yeah, right. anyway so and, and then they finally win in 2010 and it's like and then all of a sudden it's like wow we can do it. And that seems to lead to more, like with Boston Red Sox, same thing. So I think that's interesting how the the first one seems to be the toughest. And then you think, okay, For we can sure. do it, and then and a couple more come. 
Yeah, yeah, that is kind of amazing, isn't it? It's like you you get rid of that jinx finally, and then and it seems so impossible, you know, growing up. It just seems like they're never going to win a World Series, and then when they do, it's like, wow, okay, we did that. Well, the time has flown by. Our guest has been Dave Cox, 30 years in sports broadcasting. What a wonderful, what an incredible career you've had. Do you have any final words for our audience? Uh, no, just uh, I appreciate you guys having me on, and um, I'll keep trying to figure out what the best food in Cleveland, Ohio is. Shout out to my good friend Tom Adams from Pepperdine University, who's a big-time Cleveland Browns fan and still hanging in, in, the, in the area. So, um, you know, thanks for having me on, and I uh, look forward to maybe we'll uh, cross paths again someday. Yeah, I hope so, too. Again, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Dave Cox. Uh, next week, our, our our guest will be Chris Camello, covering Los Angeles sports, host of Camello's Corner Podcast. Dear listener, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night, everybody, and thanks again, Mr. Dave Cox.